Right, Matthews, out you come. What for? Out you come. Chapman wants to see you. Mr. Taylor, not here. No, he's not back in chapel yet, same. Right, get in here, Matthews, and watch. You face that wall there. You wouldn't be thinking of doing anything funny on your last day, would you, Matthews? No, sir. But just keep your eyes pinned to that wall. And keep this door wide open. Back to that wall before the screws, have you? Well, where do you go up and ask? Here. Give us a quick flash. Go on, quick flash before they come back. Behave yourself. Oh, go on. One quick flash. We'll take you a second. Hey? What about the door? Oh, get out and be a fireplace. They'll not see you there. Go on, only want to look. Go on, I'll do the same for you sometime. Go on, sharp. Quick, can I put them away, man, if somebody come in? All right, sir. Yes, thank you, Mr. Keesby. Morning, Matthews. I usually make it a practice of seeing all prisoners up for release, Matthews. See if I can help them with a, a job or a place to live. Hang these up, would you, Mary, please? Mind you, with uh, such a lot of uh, so many people out of work these days, it's becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, thank you, Mary. Yes, sir. Sit down, Matthews. Now, have you decided what you're going to do when you leave here? Yes. You sound very positive. I'm uh, still not getting through to you, am I, Matthews? I'm listening. The chief tells me you've been talking politics with the other prisoners. Not that there's anything wrong with that, mind you. I think it's, uh, it's very good and healthy that the inmates should uh, have an interest in politics, art, literature, any other kind of intellectual subject. Well, it's very stimulating. It makes a change. Providing, of course, that you're in a position to evaluate the issues correctly. Because the situation is perhaps more complicated than you imagine. A society may look chaotic sometimes, even insane. I know it does to me. But there is somewhere, deep at the very heart of things, a sense of justice and order. Are you... Take this watch of mine, for example. Twelve years I've had this timepiece. It didn't cost much, but providing I respect it and look after it, it keeps perfect time. All I have to do is to wind it up and it takes care of itself. Now look. Now see how each Wheel and spring has its own particular duty and function to perform. Everything working together in total harmony and integration. How and why, I don't know. But the point is, 
it works. And it's the same with society. Like this watch, the world is a very complex piece of machinery. And many of the problems we encounter in life appear incomprehensible. Yet, like this watch, somebody put this world of ours together. There was a plan, a grand design, a divine mechanism at work. And just as it would be silly and arrogant of me to tamper with this timepiece, so also it would be wrong, sinful, for any of us to try to change the world outside of the pre prearranged order of things. Man's real problem is to find his own personal place within this grand design and always to seek the divine intention behind everything. Yeah, well, what if things aren't right? What if wrong people are telling us what to do and what not to do? In that case, God gives us the free will to change things. Not the license to destroy, mind you, but the right to restructure society along more equitable lines. How? Through the ballot box, by working within the prearranged mechanism. You understand? Do you mind if I have a look at that? Not at all. So what you're saying is that uh, the world's like this watch? Yes, if one can visualise society along these lines. All these uh, laws and rules and institutions. Yeah, but moving, nevertheless, with a definite rhythm and to a very definite purpose. It's got a nice soft dig to it, though. Sorry about that. You did that on purpose. You deliberately dropped it. No, but if all these uh, wheels and springs are all set and we're not allowed to touch them, perhaps the only thing to do is just scrap the lot, start all over again. I will, Jack. I hope I can live up to your expectations. Ah, you won't let us down, Jack. I know that. We've waited for a long, long time for this day. Yeah, a very long time, I suppose. All I want to see is when you get down there, Bill, to make sure that you follow the policies of the way. Oh, yes, it's, uh, it's what we've lived for. It's, I know. In all my lifetime, I've always felt that uh, someday the. Uh, well, I'm not looking for a utopia just because we've got a Labour no, government. No, it takes time. It will, it will take time. Yes. 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 A final thank you to each and every one of you who have put such hard work into this campaign. Men like Jack Glover, who year in and year out has helped keep the flag of Labour flying in these parts. Let us not forget that we are here celebrating today because he was there, taking the knocks and the blows. Yeah. Yeah. 
And now we've made it. At last, we've made it. It's been a long haul, but we've made it. The election of a Labour government means that at last, people who have made money out of other people's poverty, out of social injustice in general, are at last going to get their comeuppance. And that we now have planted our feet firmly on the road to socialism. Yeah. Yeah. For intruding, I saw you on the platform just now. I felt I had to come and congratulate you. I'm Chris Harrington. Oh, how do you do? Uh, this is my wife Sarah. How do you do? Mr. Harrington's Conservative member of our neighbouring constituency. Do you mind if I sit down? No, oh, please, no, please no. do. Oh, perhaps I can offer you a cigarette. Or oh, have one of mine. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I've got a match here somewhere. Thank you. Are you planning to speak early in the house, Mr. Hargreaves? Not particularly. I shall open my mouth when I have something to say. What a very good room. I suppose the country will soon settle down to a Labour government. You'd be truly amused, Mrs. Hargreaves, if you could read some of the letters from my constituents begging me to think of some scheme to keep the socialists out. Oh, there'll be bloody revolution. You'll all be murdered in our beds. One dear old lady is quite convinced that your husbands and his colleagues want to introduce free love and abolish marriage. Well, now that I've met you and your delightful family, perhaps I can set her mind at rest on that score. You know, we have far more dotty extremists on our side than you have on yours, I assure you. What do you do with them? Oh, we keep them safely in the shires, lock them up on various pointless committees. What do you do with yours? We haven't really got any. We have the Communist Party instead. Do I take it then that the Communists won't be officially joining you? Well, that's, uh, that's a matter for conference. They'll no doubt be standing again this year. Oh, many of them are fine socialists. It's an argument about means, not ends. Unlike our argument with your people. I wonder. You're in office now. Very different from opposition. Presumably you believe in Parliament, Mr. Hargreaves, or you wouldn't have worked so hard to get there. But what happens now in the docks dispute? Will your Mr. Bevin have a strike? The agitators are calling for one. Well, what about his authority over the men if he doesn't? It might jeopardize the future of his union. Yes, well, this is all a matter for our executive, but I will say that anyone who questions Mr. Bevin's authority had better watch out. He's a big man. He is indeed an outstanding man. I think you can be sure, Mr. Harrington, the docker's claim will be settled at the expense of the employers. If it isn't, Mr. Hargreaves, this is my point, if it isn't settled, well, what about the authority of Parliament, then? I mean, what does the government do? Do they take the strike aside, stand by and refuse to govern, allow the trade of the country to be paralysed, or does it intervene and use its authority against the workers, if necessary? It won't come to that. You forget we're dealing with our own people now. Things will be different from now on. Well, perhaps you're right. I hope you are. Well, thank you, Mr Hargreaves, for a most interesting discussion. Mrs. Hargreaves, it's been a privilege to meet you both. And uh, may I give you my good wishes for your new career? Thank you. You know, it's very exciting to enter the house for the first time. You've probably got chaps on your side showing you the ropes, but if I can be of any help, don't hesitate to ask. Goodbye. Goodbye. So 
Mommy, bugger. You know me? Are you Peter? <laughs> you don't know what I'm doing. Hello, hello. Oh, how are you doing? Oh, good to see you. Yeah, good to hello. see you. Come on, come here. Hey, that's Peter. How are you doing? Hey, are you Peter? <laughs> and that's Jane. Oh, you do look thin off. You think so? You look shocking. <laughs> Jane, how old are you? Lurley five. Five? Eh? Lurley five. Nearly five? Right. You're a big lass. I never thought you'd be so big. It's cheating with your boots on, you know. Who's the artist, then? Me. Are you? Let's have a look at them. Who's are these? Who are these? Who are they? That's Mummy, that's Daddy, that's me, and that's Peter. Are they? Um, that... What? Phil says that the fellow that you've got to see down the docks is a fella called Ernie Walsh. Great. And that he's expecting you. Great, Ernie Walsh. I'll go down it morning. Can I nick one of your woodies? You haven't changed, have you? <laughs> Mind you, if Phil does get us that job down the docks, we, we ought to have a bit of a sort out, really. What are you talking about? Well, how would you and Phil feel about having a communist in the house? Communist? You? Yeah. Jesus. I thought that's what you'd say. No, I don't mean that. I mean, I'm just surprised to find you even interested in politics. Oh, mm, there's a lot happened since you saw us last time, kid. I bet there has. It's just that, you know, I don't want me and Phil to be at loggerheads all the time. I thought I just think we ought to get it sorted out. I mean, if I become a member of the party, what's he going to think? That's what I'm asking you. Phil won't mind. It would make no difference to either of us. Well, I just thought him being an MP and tied up with the unions and that, you know. No. It's been many a night and we've had Harry Pollitt in here till two or three in the morning. Pollitt? Have you? Ah, it's been like an Irish Parliament near many a time. Oh, well, that's no problem, then. Jane, are you going to come and drink this tea? Don't feel like it. Oh, you did say you wanted some, didn't you? Well, come on, come and have it. I don't know. Well, what's, what's made you start thinking like this, then? Well, we're at war and army and... And that uh, strike up in Durham, you know, etc., etc. And I suppose prison just about put top hat on it, didn't it? Well, it brought everything together, tied it all up in a knot. I met some fellas in there, and all really had their heads screwed on, you know, knew what were going on. Have you really thought about it? It's a lot of hard work, you know, when you join the Communist Party. It's I've not. Had, I've had three years in jail to think about it, Sarah. 
I suppose you have. Have you actually joined you? No, I will do as soon as I know where branch meets. <laughs> I don't know what our dad would have said if he'd heard you join the Communist Party. He'd have turned in his grave. I know. He always said you were one who took after him. <laughs> Lenin, they accepted the leader of the Bolshevik party. Historically speaking, he, he was Bolshevism. Without him, there wouldn't have been any revolution. Of course, the capitalist class and the representatives, they gloat and rub their hands at the news of his death, and well-kept yard dogs like Winston Churchill, who compares with Lenin like a vulture to an eagle, him and his cronies can strut about all he wants around the farmyard, smoking the big fat cigars and clapping one another on the back. They think with Lenin out the way that this affords them some reason to sleep at nights. They think that the October Revolution was caused by just a handful of conspirators. They ignore the question of the class forces in society. They put Lenin down as some kind of a conjurer who plucked the revolution out of a hat. But of course, we know differently. Comrade Lenin is dead. But the programme, the Marxist programme, lives. And there's no better way that we can pay respect to Lenin but by seeing that this work goes on. Now, our attitude to the Labour Party well, really, this is quite simple. But as this is a new branch, I want this to sink in because you become as a grips with the local bureaucrats very shortly. We support the Labour Party. As a rope supports a hanged man. I mean, we work within the party, but we work to expose the leadership. And any time they commit any action that we consider is detrimental to the working class, then we jump on them and we jump on them hard. In other words, under no circumstances, at no time, should we hide the real face from the masses. And I see a few new members here tonight, and for their benefit, I'd like to say this, that to be a good communist is not easy. Revolutionary politics and minority politics. From the moment that you open your eyes in the morning, your first thought must be for the party. What task can you do that day? And how best can you tackle it? You must learn to preach communism 24 hours a day. Learn to operate in a hostile environment with all the class forces pressing down on you. You put your clock ahead by tomorrow's time, so you can keep one step ahead. But above all, you become proud of the party. You defend it on all occasions and at all times. Your own aches and pains, they're secondly. Your first loyalty is to the party, to its politics and its leadership. There's no glamour, it's just Hard, day-to-day -day work, door knocking, and that's the total comrade. I think that's about all, uh, comrade chairman. He's the troublemaker. Troublemaker? Six? You two have let a bunch of ragged-ass communists stop the London docks? They'll be back tomorrow. Back tomorrow? They better be bloody back tomorrow. 
that they publicly, publicly discredit the union. And I don't want no more nonsense from either. Cars here, Mr. Bevy, we'd better go. You've got a meeting in the House of Commons on Friday, haven't you? Yes, with Purcell and Bromley. Why? Could you attend a meeting at Liverpool on Saturday afternoon with Sexton? Yes, of course. What time does it start? 12 noon. Try clipping the wings of the Communist Party, because they know as well as what we do that this strike will only last eight to ten days, and then it'll be back round the table. And any compromise on our part, and they'll steal the ground from under us. Chairman and brothers, let me say at once, immediately, without any reservation whatsoever, that if the port employers do not meet our legitimate demands for a two shilling a day increase and also a guaranteed working week, that this union will strike as and from February the 16th. <laughs> Let us make no bones about it, brothers. Whereas we know that we, the trades union does have a special relationship with the Labour government, and that we are prepared to bend over backwards so as not to embarrass them in any way, so as not to make their task any more difficult than it already is, we are not prepared to allow the employers to ride roughshod over the living conditions of working people. Yeah. I hope it won't come to that, especially as now that we are aware of the deep and heartfelt concern in Tory circles concerning the advent of a Labour government. We must, as it were, hold the fort until we can obtain a big enough majority to carry through a socialist programme which will transform society along more equitable lines. <laughs> One thing we cannot afford, one thing we cannot tolerate in the coming struggle, and it is absolutely vital that we understand this, is any division within our ranks. Let there not be any political adventurism by sectarian groups whose actions, despite their sincerity and personal integrity, can only serve to weaken our cause. Thank you, brothers. See you on February the 16th. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Brother Agrees, for those enlightening, and may I say, encouraging remarks. I'm quite sure our brothers here at the meeting will forgive you. I know you've got a train to catch at Lime Street for London. Thank you. And now, gentlemen, brothers, the meeting will be addressed by the senior shop steward from the Queen's Coburg and South End Docks. Thank you. See you soon. Excuse me, Mr. Hargreaves. I wonder if I could have a few words with you, please. Uh, what's it about exactly? Oh, I'm from the Empire News. I'd like a few words. I'm, uh, I'm writing a series of articles on the newly appointed MPs. Ah, uh, well, I'm afraid I haven't got a lot of time. Uh, well, I've got half an hour. Would that be all right? We'll be fine. Well, there's a pub just down the road that's fairly quiet. We could go there. Oh, good. Thanks very much. Cheerio, Cheerio then, Phil. Thanks very much. You've got a lot of Very nice to see you. See you in a few months. Yeah, eh? Cheers, now. Bye-bye. Do you care to buy a pink? Yeah. She pays. I like it. Well, that's it. Can I get you another drink? 
Uh, no, not for me, thanks. Let's catch my train. Oh, you're not bringing those things round here, are you? That was quite a speech you made. Thank you. You seem such a quiet person off the platform, but up there, the sparks are really flying. It must be my method of straining. You spoke about legislating capitalism out of existence. In this country, that's possible, yes. Within the institutional framework? Yes, because, see, we have a, a highly developed, civilised society based upon the rule of law where human rights and democracy are allowed to flourish. Mm, so, if a Labour government uh, planned to introduce really full-blooded socialist policies like the nationalisation of land, factories, banks, insurance, docks, the whole lot, everything, then you really think that the ruling class is going to sit back and allow itself to be liquidated? Well, that's a, that's a very hypothetical question. No, but just supposing that it happened. Well, of course, we'd expect certain resistance from varying sections of the employing classes. The big boys, with their economic power, would try to discredit us in the, with propaganda in the newspapers, etc. Naturally, the Tories and the Liberals would do everything in their power to block it by legislative means in Parliament. But as I say, it's a very conjectural proposition. We, we don't have that kind of support yet. The Russians had Lenin and his Bolsheviks. Who have you gone? The Russians needed Lenin. We don't. No? Well, I see no evidence of drunken Cossack hordes armed to the teeth, despotic landowners, dark, sinister forces plotting our downfall. Oh, perhaps I could surprise you a little, Mr. Hargreaves. Really? No, I think you journalist fellows should give us a chance. I mean, we're only just now in power. You should give us the chance to get the gloves on, as it were. What for? The fight's fixed. How do you mean? Let me tell you something, Mr. Hargreaves. A certain prominent member of the Labour government has had a meeting with a leading Tory. The issue at stake was a highly secret plan to deal with any major strike which might get out of hand. What on earth do you mean? What I'm saying is that the Cossacks are all around you, waiting for the call, if and when they're needed. At least that's the way it looks. It's a very serious charge. Can you prove it? But I can give you plenty of information to be going on with. You've heard of the Tory, J.C. Davidson? And John Anderson, the permanent undersecretary to the Home Office in the Tory government? Of course. Mm -hmm. In 1919, Lloyd George set up the Supply and Transport Committee to deal with any revolutionary situation which might develop out of the war. Last year, because of the industrial unrest, Prime Minister Baldwin revived this same committee, and he put these two men in charge. Davidson was made the chief civil commissioner and his salary was paid directly out of Tory party funds to avoid any publicity. The country was then divided up into zones, each with its own area commander or commandant. For instance, uh, Scotland was to be directly under the control of the Lord Advocate. These people were to take over from Parliament if and when private ownership was really threatened. You'd be doing what you were told at the point of a gun. So what happens to your democracy and human rights then? How did you get to know about this? When you organize an operation on that scale, I mean, when you organize what is literally a secret army, then sooner or later somebody's going to find out about it. How does the Labour government come into all this? Right up to its radical neck. These plans were set into operation in May of last year, and from what I can gather, everything went smoothly for a few months until Baldwin decided to call an election. That's when they discovered the fly in the ointment. What happens if the Labour Party gets in and all these plans wind up on the desk of some Labourite trade unionist? Not only would it be embarrassing, but uh, it would also forewarn the trade unionists of what was in store for them. So, Davidson's astute. He knows a friend when he sees one. What he did was, he went to see Josiah Wedgwood, his opposite number in your government. And what he said, more or less, was, 
It doesn't really matter which party is in power. A general strike could lead to a Bolshevik-inspired revolution. Neither of us wants that, do we? So don't shelve these plans. They might come in useful. And Wedgwood agreed. Or so I'm told. My first reaction is one of total horror, disbelief. If this is true, this amounts to the most treacherous class collaboration imaginable. But how do I know that what you're saying is true? You don't. You have my word for it. And the word of others. Whose names you can't devote. That's right. But what do you expect me to do about it? I don't know. That's up to you. Can I get you a drink? Uh, no, no, really, really must go. That's my train. Contact me now, will you? Goodbye for now. Barnett, I've told you. How do you do, Joe? Saw, yeah. Yes, Ben's told me all about you. What, uh, what are you doing here in London, then? Well, we're in a wage claim, and I saw up yeah, the lobby around Peter Pusher a bit, you know? Oh, yeah. You see, it's a swings in the roundabouts that they took off us on Black Friday three years ago. Mm, yeah. We are trying to snatch back, mm. but only this time with the Labour government in, we're not expecting so much trouble. Mm. Oh, well, I hope you do well with this. Well, I hope so. Well, mm. Joel's going to stay tonight. Oh, yeah, sure, fine. You, uh, you haven't been long out of prison then, Joe. The, re the release will last summer, you know? Yeah. Yeah, because Ben was telling me about the pitched battle you had there with the police. Oh, it was rough. Yeah. Terrible, it was. How did you meet him, Garfield? Uh, I think it went quite well, actually. Yeah. Do you say it Well, uh, no, not just yet. I say, tell Joel about Beatrice Webb. Beatrice Webb, you know what I think about Beatrice mm. Webb, don't you? Yeah. You know she is, don't you? Oh, all right. Oh, she's, she's really worried about all the kind of working class habits of Labour MPs' wives, and she's decided that now they're MPs' wives, they ought to learn how to behave like them. Yeah. Tell them. So she's teaching them how, you know, what, what cutler they ought to use when they go out to eat, how they ought to sit when they're in public. Look a lot up there, you know. That's what gets me. These are Labour MPs' wives, you know. They should be setting a bloody example. I they're see. not. Yeah. No, all they're worried about is who's going to get most like tourists fastest. Yeah. And Snowden's wife. Well, the, he's, he's Chancellor of Exchequer now. And therefore, she thinks she's got a right to number 11, which is where Kleins is a living. And that's all she can talk about or think about is why she ain't in number 11. She's so, she's so knocked about it that... So, McDonald's daughter sent us all um, invitations to have tea. And Mrs Snowden put it round that the ladies wouldn't like tea there. The ladies will prefer tea on the terrace. Can you credit that? I can't understand it, man. All the time this is going on, there's people walking the streets, have got nowhere to live, not enough to eat, and all these clowns can worry about is where they're going to have tea on the terraces. <laughs> it makes you bloody sick of this. Oh. But Ramsay McDonald's just as big a snob. He's filling his cabinet with... Tories and Liberals, working class, don't get a look in. You know, he, he didn't even give George Lansbury a job. Makes you sick. Actually, I'm quite hungry now, Sarah, if there's anything going. Yeah, what do you fancy? What have you got? Some ham, mate. Oh, come and sit for myself. I'll make you a shepherd's pie, if you like. No, I just fancy something at night. Where have the kids got to? They're playing out. I'll go and get, go and get them in a minute. What's he like, this brother of yours? He's all right. Social Democrat, full of all sorts of illusions, like, you can get on with him, you know. Do you think he's sussed out with the party? What? Do you think he's sussed out with the party? Oh, no, no, he's... he's on the left. 
Not, not as much as Purcell and Swales is. But he's not hostile. And then again, he's got this tie-up with Union, you know. Transport in general? Yeah, Ernie Bevin. You know what he thinks of us? Do I not? By the way, I've been holding the tree in prison. Oh. It was all right once I got out of the hands of the military. Well, they some stick them, lot. Yeah, they did. It was all right after that, you know. But not at first. At first it was hard. Can imagine. What about you? How'd you get on? Well, to tell you the truth, Ben, I didn't mind it. No? Mind I worried about all the white men kids were fairing and all that, like. But just a sheer pleasure and not something to think what you're going to do tomorrow morning. How you're going to face. How you're going to do this and that. How you're going to find a few bobs here, a few bobs there. Yeah. What about your Jenny? How's she going on? Oh, she's doing all right, man. She got married when I was in prison, you know. Is she? She married a pitman from all the other row. A couple of kids, no. I find it's hard, like the rest of the way, you know, but she's quite happy. She was a good lass, you were, Jenny. Oh, she's a kind lass. Have you lads eaten? Have you had something? Yes, thanks. The way we were summoned before. Yeah, right. Do you reckon to the election then, Joe? Well, obviously, I'm over the moon that Labour got in. But it's a pity we've got to rely, rely on them Liberals. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anything worthwhile you try to get through, they'll block, won't they? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Still, it's a big step forward, Joel. Oh, but them, lib them Liberals are that to come copper over Labour. It was like George O'Hamilton in 21, remember? Yeah, right. Mere feet of different tables and argue the toss with the Tories about what's on the menu. But there's no more argument about who foots a bill, it's us, the workers. Are you a member of the Communist Party as well, Yes. Joe? See much of Shinwell, Phil? Hmm. Oh. What's he like? Yeah, how do you rate him? He's a very clever man. Lots of jungle agility. Any chance of getting a pitch nationalised with him, Minister of Mines? He's a cat in arms. Why is that when a sunk report came out in favour of it? Well, you've already put your finger on it. The Liberals have prevented. Well, it's up to Labour to shove it through, then. Bugger the Liberals. Who wouldn't last a month, Ben? The Tory and Liberal vote combined would fetch us down. What good country again, then? Try again with a real socialist programme. Show sure, Liberals up for what they are. The workers who voted Labour expect something different. And if you start playing a Tory Liberal game, they'll turn away. Exactly. And say, what's the point? I know they're different. Yeah. You should both of you take the trouble to read the constitution of the Labour Party. What close for one? Yeah. The workers by hand and brain shall receive the full fruits of their industry, etc., etc. Yeah, we're going to fight for this programme, though, Phil. Yeah, well, I was under the impression that was what the election was supposed to be all about. Besides, we need experience in office. One thing the Tories do have, because they've been at it longer than we have, in abundance, is highly trained administrators. Trained? Well, experienced, yeah. Ah, oh, fleecing the workers, yes. What did Baldwin know about the pits? I say, what, what a church will ever do, but make the bollocks of the Dardanelles. Sent the troops into the Welsh coal fields. Dashed about on a bloody horse, playing polo and shouting his big mouth off. <laughs> you communist lads are all the same. No, but he's right, though, Phil. We've got plenty of organisers. We've built up the trade What you're after, we? what you're both of you after, is armed confrontation between the workers and the government. Why not? But if that's what it comes to... My experience as a pitman, look, it tells me that anything we've ever gotten, we've had to fight for. I'm just going to go out and... Find the children, Phil. Oh, killer. Yeah. What time's um, are you gonna are you gonna see your MP tomorrow, Joe? Twelve o'clock. We wouldn't be there for. Plus, there's this there's um do on that we're going to at twelve thirty to meet some Russians. Oh, so yeah. if you and a couple of your mates would like to come along. Oh yeah, we'd love to. That's all right, isn't it, Phil? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, it's fairly interesting for you to meet these people. Right. I'll see you in a minute. Shut up. Bye-bye. You know, you're dead wrong, Phil. You're completely wrong. Man. The trouble with you lot is that you... you judge everything from the Russian experience. You behave as if... every every social revolution has got to go along the same lines. Well, what other experiences are? They've gone ahead and done it. 
you know, in a way, I'm sorry they have. I'm not defending the Tsar or anything. I mean, for them, it was a good thing. It was the only way out. Yeah, and we are different, are we? Of course we are. And by the way, the credit shouldn't all go to Lenin. I mean, it was his genius that engineered the whole thing, but the system was corrupt anyway. It was rotten to the core. It had to go. Well, don't you think we've got a system that's rotten to the core here? Yes and no. Well, you can't have it both ways. Well, as a matter of fact, I believe you can. How? Well, now, you two are going to laugh at this like that for a start. Well, go on. Well, on the one hand, you've got a system whereby kids go hungry in the street and the rich get richer, which we all know is rotten. It's decadent and it's corrupt. But on the other hand, you've got a parliamentary system which allows to put something else in its place. Oh, that's now, a now, let me, let me finish. Whether, whether Baldwin, on. Lloyd George or Churchill like it or not, it's there. For years now, they've been using it to consolidate their own power. But what they can't do is just kick it aside and pretend it doesn't exist. Because if they did that, then there really would be revolution. Yeah, but it's, it's the world of the economic power that counts, isn't it? Big business holding the purse strings, calling the tune. Up to a point, yes. Up to a point, it's there. Are you honestly telling us, lad, if people get a bit rebellious, they're not going to come down on us? Man, it's on the bloody cards, man. You can bet your life on that. Well, it probably is, which is all the more reason why we shouldn't give them the opportunity Look, in the first place. Look, we challenged that authority. We took over property, and we done three years for I it. I mean, in, in, in Russia under the Tsar, if you were a communist, you'd automatically get whipped off to Siberia. Whereas in England, like it or not, you can publish your own newspapers and stand for election. Well, what does that prove? Which proves that you can change things democratically. <sighs> well, what would happen? Well, what happens if we decide democratically to take away all the wealth? The land, the banks, the factories. What happens then? Well, there'd be a stink, yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> obvious, isn't it? More than any bloody stink. Yeah, but what we've got to do is, is to convince the majority of the electorate that we are in the right. Oh, dear me, and then what would they do? Parliament would go by the board and, and they'd just rule by force. Anyway, we'll never convince the majority by simple propaganda. How can we? It's you might, well, you might. might as well piss in the Atlantic. They own the schools, the colleges, the army, the police. What else? You Courts, papers. And, and you talk to us about persuading the majority. Yeah, but, I mean, the fact remains that we are in government. No, but you're not in power. Yeah, well, just give us a chance... ..to get a majority and be in government, and then we'll show you what it's about. Wait, it's been. How's the wife? Oh, she's champion. Wait, been. We've been having a look at the sights. Champion? Well, there'd be sights. We've been having a look at Buckingham Palace. What the hell do you want to go to Buckingham Palace for? We'll see if it's still there. Have a look at it. Tommy's yeah, thinking. You know what? You just want to think this year, yourself. Walk in, man. You've seen it all happen. Well, how's that? We only went and had a look at it, man. We haven't done no, oh, you know. Oh, you're standing there and the waving doing you and stand there all of the gobshites. Just you, what you I'm want again. Just what it's I'm telling no you. Want again, you want again, you want again. You and have a look at it. It's a beautiful bloody building. We'll it's got a good reason to be bloody place. beautiful the money they're getting off us. With it. You're a bloody home. disgrace to the walking hey, look, people here, man. Time. Listen, there's a... Standing watching them lots. There's a Russian trade delegation. Come over. Have you heard of Suslov? He's oh. brought this uh, trade delegation over from Russia, oh. and Philip's fixed it up so we can meet him. So if you go see your MP, you, you know, we can go and meet him after. And oh, there'll oh, be, oh, you know, someone to eat, someone oh, to sup. Right? Oh, 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 oh,
Iso. Well, it's my better be getting along, because they'll be expecting me. Um, does Joel know how to get there? No, he won't. No, no. Well, I'll just pop over and tell him how to get there. Okay. How long have you been here? About five minutes. How do you want us to meet? Well, the skid was up the stairs, man. Well, I think he's getting around here. Yeah, so we could have told us it was a German. Yeah. Why not? You could have told me your name. I said, you're the other. All right, that's good. Could you, could you tell me where the Russians are holding a party? The Russians are over from Russia. The delegation, you know. Uh, we've been invited to this, this party. They're having a party here somewhere, and we've been invited by this MP. The They're over here trying to get through with party. this country. No, no, man. You know there's a do. You know there's a do going on. There's a party, man. A party. Look at the Russians. We've the Russians been invited is... by an MP to the party. The Russians own the party. party. Have you never been to the party? I want to know where the room is. Where the drink wine and pints of beer and sandwiches and things, man. The Russians. The Russians. This is the place you're looking at. Delegation of trade representatives from the USSR. That's right, guys. That's you, Ian. Knock, man. Oh. Never mind knocking. <coughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Can I help you? No, is this okay, where the thank you. The party, yes, this is the Russian party, oh, sir. This is what. Oh, this is, this is oh, I'm sorry, sorry, gentlemen, but this is a private party. We know, we know. Oh, we're all about that, but we've been invited here, yeah? I'm sorry, but uh, have no, you got an invitation, sir? Well, we've had an official invitation from an MP's wife. Uh, do you know the name of the MP? Hi, Philip. Uh, Philip. Oh, good. No, he's a Labour man. Oh, I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'm awfully sorry. He's coming along. Where are you now? Oh, we'll come back. back. No, what's sort him? Oh, oh, no, 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 where do you hang these? I love it, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 What sort of things are those? Well, old socialists have gone with them. Uh, so friends, man. comrades, can I have your attention, please, just for a couple of minutes, whilst they say a few words of welcome uh, to our friends from the Soviet Union. Uh, as you might know, in November last year, as a result of a resolution passed as our own trade union congress, I visited uh, Russia, uh, along with uh, John Bromley, George X, Alonzo Swales, uh, to establish closer links with our opposite number in the Soviet Union. Uh, altogether, I was there for two months. Uh, and in that time, I can honestly say that everything it was possible to see, we saw. Absolutely nothing was hidden from us. In fact, everywhere we went, along the Volga, in the Caucasus, even into the Ukraine, there were meetings going on all over the place, in the villages, in the factories, in the shops, even on the schools and on the farms, the atmosphere was one of energy, of unity, of one of achievement, pride in the achievement. Of course, there's a lot to be done. Poverty still exists. Prejudice, ignorance are still there. But the people are working hard. They're working in unity to change all this. Uh, and they will. Uh, however, my purpose today is not to give 
a report of that visit. That will be published in February. My purpose today is to welcome, on your behalf, Mr. Suslav and his comrades who make up this trade delegation. Mr. Suslav. My comrades and I thank you for your warm welcome. We look forward with confidence to the future and friendship of the British working class. To friendship. What, what did he say to you? Well, he said basically Shin will probably get what I was It's a nationalisation. He didn't want to know about it. Look, man, he, the fella just stood there and laughed at her. That's what he did. Oh, yeah. What did he, 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 he say no. to him? He says to her, there's never been any serious possibility. Them were his words. I says, well, were you serious enough about it, son? This beats walking for a living, does it? It yeah? certainly does. It certainly does. It's good stuff. Yeah. You know now why they want BMPs. Keep quiet now. We're getting it for no pocket, isn't it? Yeah. 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 You've got no right to be skeptical about. Skeptical about. The things that Russia have been, they've been through and they're going through now. Famine. The fact is that everything's gone to rack and ruin now. The people are fighting for the very existence, and yet you're sceptical. I don't lie. Under, I don't underestimate the You thing. do I underestimate. Don't, I, don't underestimate. I think Mr. Johnson is referring to a discussion we had earlier. Yeah. yeah. In our new economic policy, we will allow a certain limited reintroduction of capitalism and the profit motive. There is nothing rigid about Marxist theory. You must be realistic in some things. Because realistic means using any material that's available. Of no course. Yeah, you're attacking communism. Communism doesn't exist there. No, yeah, it, it doesn't. It, it, it isn't even socialism. All they've got is the power in the hands of the people. They've got to start building socialism. Fine, as long learning. as they're going to start building in the right direction. But you can't just build always and hope it's going to come out, right? You know, you, you're attacking... Excuse me. I think it's important to use as many people as possible. Of course, this is what I'm here for. Uh, first, this is Mrs. Robinson from the Trade Union Congress. Look, look, these landowners, the industrialists, all the people who've been dispossessed by the revolution are now being asked to come back and take up the former occupation. Do you think, do you realistically think they're going to step back out of the limelight mm. as soon as the economy's on its feet? I mean, do you think it's going to be so easy to turn the clock? No, I don't think they're going to have to. Surely they're just a sort of necessary evil until other people have learnt the skills that they've got and after that they'll be got rid of. I'm not sure I like got rid of. I, I mean, I don't mean got rid of in that sense. I mean that, that, that power will be taken away from them. <laughs> Oh, Jackie. Yes, sir. Where's the lavs round here? The gentleman's toilet, sir. Down the corridor, second on the right. I'll be able to get a piss there, will I? Oh, I hope so, sir. Here we go, man. Yeah, man. Tell you what, I know you lads did a canny job over there, but uh, you want to watch this load of shysters here, because we'll cut your bloody throat as soon as look at you, this lot. No, man, got to use your heat with this lot. Just keep your gob shut, suck that beer and bars to the lot of them. 
Anyway, it's been uh, nice meeting you, pal. Yeah, but I mean, it's quite, it's quite easy to get on with the Russian communists because they're not actually in power here. They are in Russia. When I was there, I saw no evidence at all of persecution, as Al said. We well, travelled extensively. Well, let's wait and see what's going to happen to Mr Trotsky and his friends, John. But I'd like to come back to the point that Sarah made before, because I think this is, this is the real crucial issue. These people who've been brought back in to manage to get us over the, the, the short-term obstacles, it's not going to be that easy to get them out again afterwards. You know, they've seen the way the wind's blowing. They're, they're flocking to join the party. The old bosses, the old managers are coming in as members of the Communist Party now. You're exaggerating, man. You must be. No, I'm not exaggerating. The figures are there. They're clear enough. You've only got to look at them. And, and, and to me, it just stands out. What figures? Look, after the revolution, they were going to... All the old managers, all the old bosses were going to be pushed out and replaced by people from the shop floor, by ordinary working men who were going to control their own industries and run their own factories. And in 1922, two years ago, you've got a situation where two-thirds of management were workers, shop floor men, and only one-third were, were non-workers, the old, the old bosses. And of that third, about one in seven were members of the party. Now, the figures published at the end of last year, that's only 12 months later, the whole situation's been turned over onto its head, and you've got a situation where only one-third of the managers are workers, and two-thirds are the old bosses back, finding the way back in. And, and this is the, the real key. Of those two-thirds, more than half of them, more than half of the old bosses, are members of the Communist Party. It's incredible. It's more than just incredible, sir. I think it's a very, very real danger sign. It shows the way it could be going. We were going to have this classless society in Russia, John. And what's happening? You know, already people seem to be moving in and making little niches for themselves, creating a new hierarchy. Yeah, but you're ignoring... What you're ignoring is the fact that the Communist Party are in control. They're holding the reins. They might be holding the reins, but who's the jockey? Stan. Well, Trotsky, perhaps. The party, yes. And they'll make sure everything goes on the right lines. Look, no, but I don't want to disillusion you about the communists. You're not disillusion me, mate. You can talk till you're black in face. You'll not make me not believe in what the party's doing and, and everything they stand for. I don't think we're against the concept. Is that a bit of dress? I think that's a piece of sky, is it? No, it's um, a pond. Mm. Where's he taking you then? I don't know. Some restaurant, was A bit lardy da like. So he's taking to supping wine, I know, aren't they? You're a sarcastic bugger. Who oh, is? You. You can't resist a snide remark, can you? Ah, get off, man. I'm only pulling your leg. Where does this go? I don't know. It's this corner, I think. Well. I do wish you'd stop these attacks on, on him, Ben. I'm not attacking him, you know. That the bloody union. It, you know, it's not personal. Same difference. Yeah, but, I mean, you knew what score was when I first came here, didn't I? I did tell you. I did get you that job on the docks, you know. So? And put a roof over your head when you came out of prison. What's that got to do with it? Peter, come on. I don't know. What's your dad going to say if I had turned a ride looking like an old rag bag, eh? Hang on a minute. Towel off. Thanks. This hour looks absolutely ridiculous. Oh, you're all right. Well, get him to buy you another one. You'll have to do. What I mean, Ben, is I just don't want this house torn apart because of politics. No, it won't be, love. Well, just stop bringing your arguments home. Right? You're going to give us a kiss? Mm. Right, now you're going to be nice to your Uncle Ben. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. And make sure you're in bed in half an hour. Right, you make sure, won't you, Ben? Oh, yes. OK, well. Right. Hey, I say, don't suck too much of that wine, will you?
Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Last bit. First reaction was that either he was a liar or someone for his own reasons had just invented the whole thing. Why should he want to do that? It's just that I don't know. I've been racking my brains to try and think of a motive, but I just can't come up with one. What I do keep coming back to is that he just may have got hold of the truth. Why should he want to tell you? Well, I mean, reporters do like to shock, I suppose. But on the other hand, he may just have wanted to pass it over to someone on our side. Obviously, what I can't do is just ignore it. I mean, if it's true, then how deep does our freedom go? I mean, it's, it's as if you just scratch the surface and there's a police state underneath. I mean, if it's true, what it amounts to is that there is a conspiracy against the people. And if a Labour minister can turn a blind eye to that, then where are we? I mean, if you told me a year ago that the that Baldwin and the Tories were secretly carving up the country and that there were plans to, to smash the workers in the case of unrest, I wouldn't have believed you. I wouldn't have believed that even the Tories were capable of such a thing. I mean, it's so bloody unconstitutional. And the whole basis of the system is that the police, the civil service, the army are, are under direct control from the parliament. <laughs> And that your MP can just get up in the house, ask a direct question about of what the government is doing and expect a direct answer. I mean, that's what this country stands for. It's what freedom is all about, despite political differences in peacetime. What are you going to do about it? I don't know. You can't just sit back and close your eyes to it, can you? I don't intend to. You know me better than that. What are you going to do? See Wedgwood. Demand a direct answer. Do you think I'll give you one? Mm, you'll have to. Morning, miss. Ah, how are you? I'm sorry I wasn't able to see you before, but I'm glad of It's been rather a busy week for me. Yes, of course. I did try several times. Would you sit down? Thank you very much. <clears throat> I have your letter here. I must say, it gave me rather a jolt. Who gave you this information? A reporter. Can I ask his name? I'd rather not disclose his identity. Why not? Well, the information was given in confidence. Oh, come on now. You can't just make allegations like this and then conceal the identity of the person responsible. I mean, if he's so sure of his facts, why hasn't he published them? He claimed he didn't have enough proof for that. So he sends you along like an errand boy to do his dirty work? No, that's not the case at all. No, oh, don't misunderstand me, Hargis. Well, I rather object to being called an errand boy. I object to being maligned by some anonymous journalist who happens to work for a conservative newspaper. But I've no wish to fall out with the Hargis. As a matter of fact, I respect the straightforward way you've dealt with this. I thought it best to come directly to you. Hmm. Have you discussed this with anyone else? No, of course not. Hmm. Have you arranged to see this reporter again? No. You have no communication with him whatsoever? None at all, no. Thank you. Uh, what does he hope to gain? I don't know. Oh, surely the whole object and purpose of this miserable exercise is to write a story which will enhance his personal reputation. At the same time, discredit the Labour government. Well, uh, perhaps, yes. Oh, perhaps about it. It's what this fellow's after. 
Well, he certainly wouldn't get it out from me. Oh, I'm quite sure of that. I'm simply trying to get at the heart of the matter. Unfortunately, it isn't always that simple. There are times when one has to embellish facts, conceal motives, disguise intentions, like that speech you made at Liverpool on Saturday. Oh, it was exaggerated out of all proportion. By the newspaper? Very much so. And by reporters who set out to discredit you. Yes, I suppose so. I thought that in the circumstances, that was a good speech you made. You told them exactly what they wanted to hear. Had you not done so, the influence of the communists would have been strengthened. We have a big problem there. Mm, I know you have. It's like walking on balloons. I'm sure it is. Nevertheless, what you said at Liverpool did help to spike the enemy guns, as it were. Which does raise some interesting points. I mean, how far does a Labour government go in dealing with the communist threat and at the same time ensuring that the rights and traditional liberties of the ordinary decent trade unionist are not interfered with? Mm. Now, in your own union, for example, um, how does Bevin cope with the communists in the union? With a big stick. He just walks all over them. Mm. If we did that, we'd be accused of betraying the working class. Setting up a dictatorship. Yes, if we could come back to the letter, Minister. Ah, yes. All I re really want you to do is to deny that there, any, that there is any truth in these allegations. I'm sorry, Hargreaves. Believe me, I'm not attempting to evade anything, but I refuse to confirm or deny the truth of these allegations. My responsibilities are to the Prime Minister, the Cabinet and Parliament in that order. Now, I'll tell you this. Never at any time has there been any collusion between either myself or any other member of the Labour Cabinet and Anderson, Baldwin, Davison, or any other Tory you wish to name. And that's as far as I'm prepared to discuss it with you. As for the rest, well, the powers granted to me as Chief Civil Commissioner are public knowledge. There are no secrets there. And whatever steps I take will be subject to debate and discussion in the House of Commons. Yes. But I'm sorry to go on about this, Minister, but these secret plans, if they exist, were they ever handed over for your safekeeping? I mean, that's the crux of the matter. Do you really are a very persistent fellow, aren't you, Harry? I'm sorry, but I just want to get at the truth. And what are we talking about? Now, we are agreed that there is a communist threat in your own union, for example, and that they will stop at nothing to achieve their ends is beyond question. Mm. So, isn't it the duty of any party, any government, regardless of party politics, to protect the democratic way of life, which, with all its imperfections, through the ballot box, has enabled us to take power for the first time in history? Well, there's no question about that. So, we now have a Labour government at Westminster, of which you are a part. What it boils down to is, are you prepared to trust that government? Yes, well, I felt I had to come and see you. I'm glad you did. I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time. Not at all, not at all. Worth discussing. Well, I'll be going. Good day, John. Thank you very much. Can you find your own way out? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Good day, John.